Hi learners, it's Em from Sano Nerds, and this video is on Unit 8, Urinary Tract Anatomy, Physiology, and Ultrasound Appearance. Unit 8, Urinary Tract Anatomy, Physiology, and Ultrasound Appearance. The urinary tract consists of the right and left kidneys, right and left ureters, bladder, and urethra. In the asymptomatic patient, the ureters and urethra are not well visualized by ultrasound. However, the kidneys and bladder are well seen and can easily be assessed with ultrasound and therefore will be the main focus of this unit. This unit will cover the embryology, location, anatomy, microanatomy, physiology, lab tests, and ultrasound appearance of the kidneys and bladder as it pertains to the sonographer. Section 8.1, Global Anatomy. As always, we'll start with embryology, location, and anatomical relationship of the kidneys and bladder. The kidneys start to develop at about week four, but they don't really become functional until about week 12 and they go through a metamorphosis during this period, starting with the pronephros, moving to the mesonephros stage, and then finally the metanephros, which are the final functional kidneys. The important part about the embryology and the kidneys is to know that the kidneys develop in the pelvis and then eventually will ascend into the abdomen. This is super important for a couple of reasons. First one, the kidneys and the genitals kind of develop from the same area. That's why we see a lot of overlap in pathology that involves both the genital and urinary tract systems. The other thing, especially for sonography, if we don't see a second kidney up where we expect it to be, we always need to go down to the pelvis and take a look. It is possible for the kidneys to get stuck in the pelvis and we call it a pelvic kidney. So we have an example here in this picture, the kidney just kind of gets stuck down in the pelvis and the other one rows up to where we would expect it to be. As you learn in your studies, the ascension of the kidneys into their correct space in the abdomen doesn't always go quite right. And it all stems from the fact that the kidneys start in the pelvis and eventually ascend into the abdomen. The bladder is going to develop between weeks four and seven. Prior to its functioning, the bladder is drained via the allantois. Now the allantois is a little outpouching on the embryo's front that connects with the yolk sac and its main purpose is to get rid of liquid waste and help with the exchange of gases and that kind of stuff before the placenta takes over. Eventually the allantois will close and it forms the urachus. The urachus then is kind of a fibrous cord that's going to help tether the bladder to the abdominal wall. However, it is possible for that urachus to remain open after birth and we'll see little ones coming in with urine leaking out of their belly button or we might just see a partially patent urachus where it's just kind of a cystic -y area at the top of the bladder. However, for most people though, it will become that ligament which anchors the bladder to the abdominal wall. Now the ureters are outpouchings that are formed during the mesonephros stage and they're going to connect to the bladder. The mesonephric ducts become the ejaculatory ducts in males and in females they tend to degenerate because of low testosterone. As far as the urethra, the urethra in males is going to develop differently than it does in females, and it's going to develop in two stages. We have one developing from the urogenital sinus of the cloaca, and then part of it developing in the phallus. In females, they only develop the urethra from the urogenital sinus. This kind of brings us back to the urogenital connection as well, because the urogenital sinus is the part of the embryo that will differentiate into both the genitals and the urinary tract system. And the urogenital sinus is found on the cloaca, which is the early digestive excretory genital portion of the embryo. The kidneys are retroperitoneal organs, and they're going to be located a little bit more medially in the body towards the posterior, towards the person's back. The right kidney is found posterior to the liver, and the left kidney is posterior to the spleen. Due to the size difference of the liver and the spleen, the right kidney tends to be just a little bit more inferior and more medial in the body than the left kidney is. This also causes the right kidney to be just a little bit smaller than the left kidney. On the posterior side of the kidney, we will see that they are partially protected by the 11th and 12th rib. The bladder is going to sit further down within the pelvis below the peritoneal cavity. It is between the rectum and pubis symphysis or in between the uterus and the pubis symphysis. The ureters, which are also retroperitoneal organs, connect the kidneys to the bladder. With the kidneys being medial in the body and at the lower portion of the abdominal organs, the kidneys come in contact with a lot of the organs on their anterior surface. Once we locate the right kidney, we see that it is inferior and lateral to the right adrenal gland, it is inferior and medial to the liver, superior to the hepatic flexure, and lateral to the duodenum. The left kidney we'll see is inferior to the left adrenal gland, inferior to the spleen, superior to the splenic flexure, 
and then lateral to the pancreas tail. Both of the kidneys are going to sit anterior to the diaphragm, psoas muscle, and quadratus muscle. This image here helps to illustrate how many organs that the kidneys come in contact with as they sit in the body. This is an anterior approach, so we are looking from the front of the person towards their back, and what we'll see is the IVC towards the patient's right, aorta towards the patient's left. The right kidney then is going to be in contact with the liver, right adrenal gland, duodenum, and the hepatic flexure on its anterior side. Looking at the left kidney, again we see it sits a little bit higher, a little bit more lateral, and we'll see that it's in contact with the left adrenal gland, spleen, stomach, pancreas, jejunum, and the splenic flexure. If we flip it around and take a look from the back side, now we've got the aorta still towards the patient's left, IVC towards the patient's right. We're looking from their back. We will see on the back side of the right kidney, the 12th rib will just graze the top of the right kidney. The diaphragm will come down lower and then medially will be the psoas, then the quadratus lumborum muscle, and finally the transversalis fascia. Over on the left side, which again sits a little bit higher because it's only underneath the spleen, it does come in contact with the 11th rib and the 12th rib, also the diaphragm, and then again medially we have the psoas muscle, quadratus lumborum, and the transversalis fascia. These images are also very helpful for understanding how the structures that go in and out of the hilum of the kidney are associated. So remember this is a posterior approach, so the most posterior structure is the ureter, and then we have the renal arteries, and then moving to the most anterior part, the renal veins. Just like the liver had a cover on it, the kidneys are also covered, but they are covered by four layers. So working from inner to outer, we have the renal capsule, which is known as the true capsule, perirenal fat, perirenal fascia, which is known as Gerota's fascia, and then finally, pararenal fat. So looking at this image, again, we are starting on the inside, the most inner covering, and we have the renal or true capsule. The renal capsule is a fibrous capsule that surrounds just the kidney. Outside of this is going to be a very thin layer of perirenal fat. So that's what we're seeing here in the orange-ish color. And then surrounding the kidney, the perirenal fat, and the adrenal gland is Gerota's fascia. Gerota's fascia is another fibrous capsule that is going to surround these structures as well as the proximal portion of the ureter. And then our fourth and final layer is the pararenal fat, which is another fat capsule that surrounds everything within Gerota's fascia. Section 8.2, renal anatomy. The kidney is divided into four distinct areas, the renal parenchyma, renal sinus, collecting system, and hilum. The renal vasculature is also a very important part of the renal anatomy. Starting with the renal parenchyma, the parenchyma is the soft tissue of an organ. The soft tissue of the kidneys is made up of lobes. A lobe is going to consist of one pyramid and blood vessels. The renal parenchyma consists of the cortex, medulla, and the columns of Burton. Now the cortex is the outermost portion of the kidney, and it's home to some of the microanatomy of the nephron, the renal corpuscle, and the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. The medulla is the middle layer of the renal parenchyma. The renal parenchyma is going to be made up of renal pyramids. In adult kidneys, there's about eight to 18 of these pyramids per kidney. The renal pyramids also contain parts of the nephron, in particular the loops of Henle. The renal pyramids take on a roughly triangular shape. The base, which is the wider portion, is going to be out towards the cortex, and the apex, which is the pointy side, sits within the minor calyces. The apex of the pyramid is also known as the renal papilla. In between the renal pyramids, then, are the columns of Burton. These are going to be bands of cortex that extend in between the pyramids. The renal sinus then is the central portion of the kidney that is made up of a fatty, fibrous tissue. Through the renal sinus, we see lymphatics, nerves, arteries, and veins. So in this picture here, we are able to see the cortex along the outside here. We're seeing a renal pyramid, and this part has been cut away to show us the collecting system. So this is the 
renal papilla sitting within a minor calyx. What the renal sinus actually is, is the area that these vessels are running through. And it's going to be the fatter, brighter part of the kidneys that we see on ultrasound. So anywhere that you can kind of see this cutaway part is considered part of the collecting system. It is the fibrous tissue that lays over all of this that is considered the sinus. Speaking of the collecting system, the collecting system starts with the nephron in the microanatomy of the kidney. The visible portion of the collecting system starts with the minor calyx, which sits at the apex of the pyramid, and then the minor calyces are going to converge to form major calyces. The minor major calyces form the infundibula, and those are going to join together to form the renal pelvis. From the renal pelvis then, we see the ureter. So again, we have our cortex, which contains part of the nephron. The medulla contains some more parts of the nephron, and the biggest thing that's going to connect out of the collecting system is the collecting tubules. The collecting tubules are going to travel towards the apex or the renal papilla of the renal pyramid, and we see that sitting right within the minor calyces. Now where those minor calyces are surrounding the apex, remember those are gonna be minor, they are going to join together to form the major calyce. So we go from minor, the little ones, joining together to form major. When we get into the more straight area, through here and through here, all of these are the infundibula or infundibulum. As they join together, they are going to form the renal pelvis, and the renal pelvis then empties out through the ureter. The hilum of the kidney is found on the medial portion of the kidney as a vertical opening. Through the hilum, structures exit and enter the kidney. Moving from anterior to posterior, the major hilum structures are going to include the renal vein, which is exiting, the renal artery, which is entering, and the ureter, which is exiting. So again, anterior to posterior, the most anterior structure is the renal vein, followed by the renal artery, and then the ureter underneath. So if you can think of it as like an exiting, entering, exiting sandwich, or, and if you remember that exiting is on either side, then those go in alphabetical order, renal vein to ureter. You need to remember that the vein is that most anterior part, followed by the artery, finally the ureter behind everything. There are other structures that enter and exit through the hilum, such as lymphatics and nerves, but we really don't see either of those by ultrasound. So to recap some of those structures that we've talked about, again, the cortex is the most outer portion, moving to the medulla, which contains the pyramids. The pyramids are going to empty into the collecting systems. The first part that they go through is the minor calyx. Those join together to form the major calyx, which then join to form the infundibula, which join to form the pelvis, and then that is going to exit out of the ureter. The nephrons of the kidney are found out in the cortex and into the medulla, and we'll take a closer look at that during our microanatomy session. And in a couple slides here, we're going to take a look at how these vessels course through the kidney as well. I always think it's interesting to take a look at gross anatomy as well. We're very used to seeing these in black and white or diagrams of them, but this shows us nicely too all those structures that we're going to be able to see on ultrasound. So again, we have the cortex on the outside. You can see the renal pyramid here. We've got the columns of Burton in between each of the pyramids. And then we can kind of see how the pyramid apexes or the renal papilla are sitting within the minor calyces and how they all join together to get to the renal pelvis, which is right at this hilum here. Remember the hilum is a kind of a vertical incision on the medial side of the kidney. And that's where we're going to see the ureter exit the renal artery come in, and the renal vein exit. And as mentioned, up next we have the renal vasculature. Now the kidneys receive blood directly from the aorta via the renal artery. Once passing through the hilum, the renal artery branches into smaller arteries until reaching the cortex. In the cortex, the renal artery is going to continue to become smaller and smaller and smaller to form the glomerulus of the nephron where the filtration process is going to start. The capillaries that are found in the nephrons are going to aid in the exchange of waste and electrolytes, and then the vessels are going to start to converge to form the veins getting bigger and bigger as they exit towards the hilum to form the renal vein. The renal vein then connects back directly to the IVC. As you're studying, you should be able to recognize the path of blood from aorta to kidney to IVC, and then also know the location of the vessels in regards to major landmarks. 
So starting with the extra renal vascular key points, I want to make sure to point out that the right renal artery is longer than the left renal artery because of location. The right kidney sits further away from the aorta than the left kidney sits away from the aorta. The way that right artery needs to travel to the kidney also means that it travels posterior to the IVC. At the hilum, remember the renal vein is the most anterior vessel. It's going to be anterior to the renal artery. And then we see that the right renal vein is shorter than the left renal vein, and that is because the right kidney sits closer to the IVC than the left kidney. And as that renal vein is coursing back to the IVC, we see that the left renal vein is going to go in between the SMA and the aorta. So again, we've got that the right renal artery is longer than the left renal artery. That's just solely because of location. We see that the right renal artery travels posterior to the IVC. At the hilum, we are going to see that the vein sits anterior to the artery, and that's true for both sides. And then we see that the left renal vein is longer than the right renal vein, again due to location. And as that left renal vein comes back, it travels under the SMA, but over the aorta. So it's right in between the two to get back to the IVC. Now some key points about the intrarenal vasculature that I want to point out include that there are five segmental arteries. The interlobar arteries and veins are going to travel in between the pyramids. The arcuate arteries and veins wrap around the base of the pyramids. And from the arcuate arteries, we have the expansion of the cortical radiate arteries and veins extending into the cortex. And lastly, for whatever reason, most books do not include a segmental vein. Now when I show you a picture of the intrarenal vasculature, you are going to wonder why we don't include a segmental vein. In fact, somebody had recently asked about this on social media and it got me kind of thinking about it. So I did do some research on it. The best thing that I could figure out from what I learned was that there was a book way back in the day that left it out and that just happened to be the book that everybody used. And since then, it has been left out of anatomy. But like I said, when we look at the picture, it'll clearly look like there's a segmental vein because we have segmental arteries, but for whatever reason, most books do not include the segmental vein in the literature. With those key points in mind, again, we need to know what the path of blood flow is. Starting at the aorta, we're going to take a direct turn into the renal artery. Renal artery then is going to reach the hilum of the kidney and be inside the kidney. At this point, it's going to branch first into segmental arteries, then into interlobar arteries, then arcuate arteries, and finally cortical radiate arteries. At this point, the vessels are very, very tiny and we're at the nephron. In the nephron, the first thing we're going to see are afferent arterioles. Those are going to go into the glomerulus, exit via the efferent arterioles, which are going to travel to the peritubular capillaries. This is kind of the end of the nephron blood exchange area. So now we're going to start to see the veins starting to converge together as it moves through the hilum to remove blood from the kidneys. So from the peritubular capillaries, we'll see venules start to form. Those venules then are going to turn into cortical radiate veins. The cortical radiate veins join together to form the arcuate veins and then the interlobar veins. Now this is where the segmental veins would come in, but again, most books don't include them in their literature. So in theory, interlobar veins then go to converge to the renal vein, which will head back to the IVC. One thing that I want to point out about this picture before we get too far into it, the afferent arterioles in this image are not included in the nephrons, but some books do include them in the nephrons. The afferent arterioles are the tiny little blood vessels that bring blood into the glomerulus. So I do feel like they are part of more of the nephron circulation. And so we will talk about it a little bit more when we get to the microanatomy. Let's look at the big picture first though. Remember we've got the aorta over here and it is going to branch into a left and a right renal artery. So we have the renal artery coming in. Once it gets to the hilum, it is going to branch into the segmental arteries. So we have usually about five segmental arteries. Those arteries are going to travel towards the periphery of the kidney. And as they travel in between the pyramids here, 
This is where we get our interlobar arteries. Remember the lobes included a vessel and a pyramid. So we have the interlobar arteries. They're going to wrap up and around the base of the pyramid. This is where we get the arcuate arteries. And off of the arcuate arteries, we will see the cortical radiate arteries. So at this point then, we're gonna to jump to the magnified section. So here is our arcuate artery, and it is giving rise to the cortical radiate artery. And from here, there's these little branches that come off, and these are gonna be the afferent arterioles. The afferent arterioles are gonna go into the glomerulus, which is kinda of like this big ball of vessels out here. And the blood that goes into the glomerulus is then going to exit out of the efferent arterioles. The efferent arterioles are going to meet up with the paratubular capillaries and the vasa recta, which kind of surround the nephron here. And then those are going to start to form together to make venules. And the venules eventually are going to make the cortical radiate veins. So those are those little stalks that are coming up. Veins are going to converge together and go to the arcuate vein. So arcuate artery and vein are at the base of the pyramid. The arcuate veins are going to merge together again to form the interlobar veins. So those again are going to travel in between the pyramids. So we're going to head back to the big picture. We are right here at the interlobar vein. Now this is where many people would think that we do have segmental veins. However, you can see that this diagram does not include them. So we consider then that the interlobar veins are going to converge directly together to form the renal vein, which will head back to the IBC. Section 8.3, ureter, bladder, and urethra anatomy. Now the rest of the urinary tract anatomy only really needs a brief discussion as it does not hold a whole lot of pertinence to ultrasound. The ureters begin in the kidney at the renal pelvis and they're gonna end posteriorly at the trigon portion of the urinary bladder. The ureters are comprised of three layers. We've got the inner mucosa layer, a medial layer, which actually has quite a bit of muscle in it, and an outer fibrous layer. Now it's that muscle layer of the ureter that's going to pair cells. Remember that's that rhythmic contraction to move urine from the kidney to the bladder. Once in the bladder, the bladder is going to hold on to that urine. Uh, it is a very stretchy, elastic, muscular sac, and it's going to collect that urine from the ureters to hold on to it before it excretes it through the urethra. At the base of the bladder, on the posterior portion is where the trigon is located. That's where those ureters are going to enter into the bladder. So the trigon is on the posterior inferior part of the bladder. The trigon is going to receive both ureters, and that kind of is two corners of the triangular area of the trigon. And then we see the out or the neck of the bladder also at that trigon, and that's going to be the area that turns into the urethra. The bladder is also made up of layers and actually has four layers, the inner mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and then the outer serosa. So the inner mucosa and the submucosa and the muscularis are all very, very stretchy. When the bladder is empty and we look at it with ultrasound, we can actually see really, really thick walls. It kind of looks lumpy and bumpy in there. And that's because everything's kind of folded up on itself. As the bladder starts to fill with urine, we're going to see those walls stretch out and become smoother. So here we have a diagram of the bladder. Again, we have the serosal layer on the outside. That's kind of a fibrous serosal layer. And then we get into the muscle layer. And then we have the two mucosal layers on the inside. When the bladder is empty, we will see kind of this rough edges to it. But as it fills up, everything stretches out and smooths out. Now there's this huge section cut away. And that is because we want to take a look at this trigon area. Remember, this is more towards the posterior portion of the bladder on the inferior side. And what we're going to see is the ureters come down and around and insert right on the corners of the trigon. And then the out is the pointy part of the trigon. So when you're looking for urinal jets, you'll want to scan more posteriorly and very inferior on the bladder as you wait for those ureter jets to show up in your ultrasound images. The urethra then is a membranous hollow canal that is going to allow for the removal of urine from the bladder. In males, it's about 20 centimeters long, and we see that it has three separate parts. We have the prosthetic urethra, the membranous urethra, and then we also have the penile urethra 
the urethra in the males, acts as part of the ejaculatory pathway as it is connected with other ducts that are connected to the testicles. So it does serve as dual purpose for the urogenital tract systems. In females, we see that the path of the urethra is very short. We just have about a three and a half centimeter tube that connects the bladder to the outside. Section 8.4, renal variants. Now for the purpose of the kidney discussion, defining a renal variant from a congenital anomaly, I feel is important. In this lecture, what I've included for the most part are renal variants, which lead to relatively inconsequential changes to the normal appearance of the kidney. Congenital anomalies are going to carry more of a risk for associated pathology, and therefore we're going to save more of those for the pathology unit. Now what you'll see as we look at these renal variants are really just some small changes to part of the renal parenchyma that make the kidney just look a little different than what we would expect. Now the first one is the prominent column of Burton, and this is going to be a large invagination of the hypertrophied renal cortex into the medullary portion of the kidney. Now remember, we had columns of Burton in between all of the pyramids. That's a normal thing that occurs. When it becomes a prominent column of Burton, the column becomes almost double the size that we would expect, and it's just very prominent in the kidney images. The next one then is dromedary hump, and this is going to be a bulge of cortical tissue from the lateral surface of the kidney, and we typically see this on the left side. So in most kidneys, we just kind of have a flat back here, in the dromedary hump kidney, we'll see a large hump or a bulge coming off the backside of the kidney. It's named for the dromedary camel because it has a similar appearance. Now we usually see this on the left side because the spleen sits right in here and kind of pushes the kidney parenchyma to form this hump. The next one then is the junctional parenchymal defect, and this occurs when those lobes don't quite fuse all the way as we would expect. So we see a partial fusion of the two renal ranunculi that are going to fill in with fat, and we're going to typically see it on the anterior surface of the superior pole. So here we have basically a normal kidney. Remember the lobes of the kidney are a pyramid, each with some blood vessels, and we'll see that junctional parenchymal defect when those lobes don't quite fuse all the way together. And if they don't fuse all the way together, we're going to see that perirenal fat fill in the gap. And so this has a very distinct look on ultrasound, which we'll take a look at later. The next renal variant then are fetal lobulations. So persistent infantile appearance to the kidneys is called fetal lobulations. And this is going to occur when the renal cortex slightly indents around the calluses. Very normal to see this in children up to five years old, but it's not uncommon to see it in adults as well. Basically, as we age and walk around and move around, the kidneys get bumped around enough where they start to kind of smooth out. So when you scan a newborn, this is very normal to see because their kidneys haven't been jostled around enough or ran into other organs quite enough. As we get older, these real obvious lumps on the outside start to kind of smooth out and we have a much different appearing kidney as an adult, but it's completely fine to still have this appearance. Next up, then we have the extra renal pelvis. So remember that the pelvis of the kidney is the area that's going to collect the urine before it exits through the ureter. The normal renal pelvis is going to be seen inside the kidney a little bit more, surrounded a little bit more by that cortical tissue. In the extra renal pelvis, what we see is that there is a large collection area outside of the kidney. So with this, we end up seeing longer major calluses, longer infundibula, and then this area can become very stretched out, and when that happens, it tends to hold on to urine, which can make it very prominent. So extra renal pelvis typically is not a problem when we find it. This might make the person a little bit more susceptible for upper urinary tract infections, but for the most part, when you see it, if you roll them around, you can get the urine to come out of here and go down the ureter. So if you can move the patient and get rid of the urine at the hilum, then you can prove that's an extra renal pelvis versus fluid being caught up in the kidney with hydronephrosis. Next, we have sinus lipomatosis. Sinus lipomatosis is seen when there are extra fat deposits within the sinus. So remember the sinus is already made up of fatty fibrous tissue. There's just extra fat in sinus lipomatosis kidneys. And when that occurs, the sinus is going to appear to take up more of the kidney 
making that cortex appear very thin. So when you look at this, it's going to be very echogenic on ultrasound because fat appears more echogenic. And the sinus is going to appear to take up much more of the kidney than we would expect. For most people, this is just fine. The kidney doesn't function any differently than what we would expect. And that is why it is considered more of a renal variant. Now, the last one that's technically not a renal variant and is probably more of a congenital anomaly is renal agenesis. Renal agenesis is the absence of the kidney. We'll learn a little bit more about renal agenesis in the pathology portion. However, renal agenesis does occur. It's fatal if it's bilateral because we cannot live without kidneys. Usually bilateral agenesis is going to result in an in utero demise. However, it is possible to live with only one kidney. And what we see the one kidney end up going through is compensatory hypertrophy. And that means that it's going to get really, really big to take up the role of what would have been two kidneys. So we'll learn later that the normal kidney size is probably right around 11, 12 centimeters. These single kidneys sometimes get up to like 15, 16 centimeters because they're doing the work of two kidneys. Section 8.5, renal microanatomy. Now the microanatomy and physiology of the kidney are really complex subjects and for the most part really beyond the scope of what a sonographer needs to know. For microanatomy, I want you to focus on the parts of the nephron and the pathway of blood and urine through the vessels and tubules. The nephrons are the functional unit of the kidney. This is where filtration, absorption, and exchanges of waste, nutrients, and water is going to occur. There are about a million nephrons in each kidney, and there are two parts to each nephron with their own components. The first part is the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is comprised of the renal capsule, which is also known as Bowman's capsule, and the glomerulus. The second part of the nephron is the renal tubule. The renal tubule is going to consist of the proximal convoluted tubules, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubules, and the collecting ducts. So here we have our diagram of the nephron. Again, we have a million of these in each kidney. And what we will see out in the cortex is where the nephron starts. All that blood coming in from the body and out into the cortex through the cortical radiate arteries. Once we're in the cortex, those cortical radiate arteries are going to connect into the blood system with the nephron, which starts with the glomerulus. Blood is going to come in through here. Substances are going to pass over into Bowman's capsule. And then those substances are going to move their way through the tubule system, exchange fluids and exchange electrolytes, throughout the tubule system, and in the end, urine ends up in the collecting tubules to go out to the calluses and then the pelvis, ureter, bladder, and out of the body. This picture here shows nicely the medulla or the renal pyramid, and you can see how the renal papilla is actually an exit for that urine to enter into the minor calluses. There are two types of nephrons that you need to be aware of. The two types are the cortical nephron and the juxtamedullary nephron. Now the glomerular part is out in the cortex for both of these types of nephrons. But what we will see is that the cortical nephron is going to sit closer to the edge of the kidney and it's going to have very short loops of Henle. So remember we've got our proximal convoluted tubules. This is our loop of Henle here. And then that is going to join up with the distal convoluted tubules that will join up with the collecting tubules. So cortical nephrons, most of their functional parts are out in the cortex with just a little bit going into the medullary. Compare that then to the juxtamedullary nephron. If it helps to remember, juxta means next to. So these are the nephrons that are found next to the pyramids. The glomerulus sits much closer to that pyramid base. The proximal convoluted tubule comes out, and this is the loop of Henle here, and it's super, super long. It's going to cover more area in the renal pyramid. It's again going to join back with the distal convoluted tubules and head into the collecting tubules. So cortical, short loops of Henle found more in the cortex. Juxtamedullary start next to the medullary pyramids and have long loops of Henle. We've already touched on blood flow through the nephron, but I really like this visual as a reminder of how the blood flow works. So remember we've got interlobar arteries 
which are going to branch into the arcuate arteries. And from the arcuate arteries, we're going to see the radiate artery come off. So the radiate artery were those tiny little stalks that went into the cortex, and they're going to have tiny little afferent arterioles that come off of them. And these are going to go to those millions of nephrons that are in each kidney. So the afferent arteriole is a branch of the radiate artery, and the afferent arteriole is going to bring blood into the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is kind of this blob of blood vessels that's in contact with Bowman's capsule. And this vessel is very tiny, Bowman's capsule is very porous, and this is where we're going to see our first filtration occur in the nephron. So we're going to see exchanges of all sorts of things in this area. And then anything that doesn't go into the nephron, so typically like red blood cells, some proteins, other big ticket items, those are going to stay in the blood and they are going to leave the glomerulus through the efferent arteriole. The efferent arteriole then is going to branch into even tinier capillaries known as the peritubular capillary network or the vasa recta. And these tiny little vessels are going to surround the tubules of the nephron. And their job is to continue exchanging waters and electrolytes and anything else that needs to be filtered or added back to the blood as the nephron does what it needs to do. And so as they kind of surround all of that, they're going to get what the body needs, get rid of what the body doesn't need, and eventually all those blood vessels are going to come together to form a venule. That venule then is going to join up with the radiate vein. Radiate vein is going to join up with the arcuate vein, interlobar vein, and converge and converge until it finally gets back to the IVC to bring all that nice new filtered blood from the kidneys back to the rest of the body. Anything that doesn't make it back into the blood then is going to stay in the tubule system and eventually make it into the collecting ducts where it will leave the body. Section 8.6, renal physiology. So the kidneys are responsible for filtering our blood, which creates the urine, which is a method by which we get rid of waste products from the body. The kidneys are also going to help control blood pressure and the creation of new blood cells in response to certain hormones, so they're responsible for maintaining homeostasis as well. Now you should be able to follow the creation of urine and its pathway out of the body, plus identify hormones and their effect on the kidneys. So first we're going to take a look at the creation of urine, and we've already talked a little bit about this, so this will be a lot of review. But filtration takes place at the glomerulus. So blood comes in to the glomerulus via the afferent arteriole, and then there's going to be pressure differences in the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule that are going to cause substances to cross between the glomerulus and into the capsule, which is the start of the nephron. Some of the substances that are going to cross over at this point include water, salt, sugars, urea, and amino acids. So all of those are going to enter into Bowman's capsule and then head into the proximal convoluted tube here. In healthy people, when the glomerulus is acting the way it should, there aren't big gaps in the capillaries. There isn't large damaged big holes in here that can allow blood to kind of move into areas that we don't want it to move into. What we see is that the red blood cells and proteins like albumin are going to be way too big to exchange through this nephron. And again, that's in a healthy nephron. So that stuff stays in the glomerulus and will exit out of the glomerulus through the efferent arterioles, which then connect back to those peritubular capillaries. When we see renal disease, what we start to see is proteins starting to show up in the urine, and that's because there's way too big a gap somewhere in here. The glomerulus has broken down, allowing for exchanges of bigger items. So if we have blood in the urine, that could be from the tubules itself, or it could be actual bleeding out of the glomerulus and it's getting into the tubule system. If we have proteins, in our, if we have, if we have certain types of proteins in our urine, that's again because there's some sort of damage to the glomerulus, which is allowing for the passage of the wrong substances into the nephrons. So after the glomerulus, which did a whole bunch of the filtering, now we've got a substance within the nephrons, and what we're going to see in the proximal convoluted tubules is reabsorption. So through the proximal convoluted tubules, the kidneys are going to respond to what the body needs. It's going to take some of that water out. It's going to reabsorb the salts. 
and the nutrients that it wants. It's going to put toxins back in, and this is all going to be crossing over through that peritubular capillary network. In fact, there's just so much energy exchange going on through here through this process that it takes up about 6% of your daily calories just to do the transport of all of these materials in the nephrons that your kidneys have to do every day. So after the filtrate moves through the proximal convoluted tubule, it's going to head into the loops of Henle. Now there's the descending loop of Henle. There's the kind of actual loop part of it. And then there's the ascending loop of Henle. In the descending loop of Henle, this is typically where water is going to be taken out. So it ends up being through this area that is the most concentrated part of the urine. And then as it comes up through the ascending loop, the body's going to take back all the salts that it wants from the urine as well. So we tend to see the most concentrated urine in the loops of Henle. After the loops of Henle, the filtrate is then going to move into the distal tubule. And again, this is where some more filtration, but more specifically secretion occurs. And this is where water and other ions and other substances are going to be finally put back into the urine to be removed from the body. So at this point, what we typically see are going to be urea, ammonia, different types of drugs, be it medicines or others, uh, hydrogen and some potassium are going to make up a good portion of the urine at this point. And then the body will give whatever water it needs to give at this point. And all of that then is going to head to the collecting duct. Now the collecting duct, again, is going to take back some of the water, kind of balance out again, how much the body needs to get rid of versus keep. And then from the collecting duct, it's going to head into the collecting system. So the collecting system then is where we want to recognize the path of urine. So the collecting tubules are in the medulla and the collecting tubules are going to head towards the apex of the medullary pyramids, which is known as the renal papilla. From the renal papilla or the apex of the pyramids, we are going to then see urine enter into the minor calyx. The minor calyx are going to join together to form the major calyx, which will join together to form the infundibulum. So the infundibulum is these straighter parts of the collecting system. The infundibulum then are going to empty into the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis then connects to the ureter and the ureter is going to be responsible for heading down to the bladder and eventually we will pee it out through the urethra. I had mentioned at the top of this unit that there are some hormones that we should be aware of when we're talking about the kidneys and how they know what the body needs. The kidneys are going to respond to hormones that react to a decrease in blood volume. So as all of that material moves through the nephron and we're doing all that water exchange, the kidneys are going to recognize that we need more water within the blood because we're low on blood volume. So they're going to take out less water from the blood. They're going to increase the salt that goes out into the blood. And therefore that's going to help improve the blood volume. The other thing that the kidneys are kind of sensitive to is how much oxygen is in the blood. And so if there is a decrease in oxygen, then the kidneys are actually able to release their own hormone, which can tell the body to increase the amount of red blood cells it is producing. So as a sonographer, do you need to know these hormones? No. Should you kind of understand why the kidneys do what they do and their effect and role in keeping homeostasis? Absolutely. Remember that the kidneys are going to react to hormones released by the body, typically ones that respond to low blood volume, and therefore, they are going to reduce the amount of water that they take out of the blood. So they're going to improve blood volume by not removing water from the blood to release as urine, but rather keep it in the system to kind of pump up the blood volume. Section 8.7, renal chemistry. Now the lab values associated with the kidneys are more of an indicator of their function. Ultrasound cannot determine function, but we can see if there are any structural changes or changes in the parenchyma echogenicity. The main lab tests that you should be familiar with are going to be creatinine, GFR, BUN, and urine analysis. Creatinine levels can be measured either as a blood test or as a urine test. Creatinine is a waste product that is made by the muscles, just part of our regular everyday activity. So normally our kidneys are going to filter the creatinine out. They're going to remove it from the blood and then send it into the tubules and out the body with our urine. 
But if there's a problem with the kidneys, then they can't filter out that creatinine very well, and it ends up building up in the blood. So when a person is experiencing kidney damage, their creatinine levels in their blood increase, and we will see less creatinine being released through the urine. Typically, when we see those high levels of creatinine in the blood and low levels in the urine, it's going to indicate some sort of kidney disease or a condition that's going to affect how the kidneys are functioning. So other diseases that can cause the kidneys to malfunction are going to include autoimmune diseases, bacterial infections, blocked urinary tract, heart failure, and even complications of diabetes. However, abnormal creatinine does not always mean kidney disease. There are life stages or lifestyles that can cause creatinine to increase as well. So pregnancy is actually pretty rough on the kidneys. It just has a lot more to do, so that can cause creatinine to increase. So can intense exercise, because remember, creatinine is a byproduct of our muscles just doing what we need to do every day. So if we're working out really, really hard, there's more creatinine being released by the muscles, and then if there's more in the blood, then the kidneys might not filter it all out, so it might alter our numbers. A diet high in red meat, because red meat is muscle, so if you're ingesting muscle and then breaking it down, you're going to have that excessive creatinine. And then there's actually some medicines that can cause creatinine levels to rise. So it's not always due to renal failure itself. It could be a complication of another disease or some sort of lifestyle condition. GFR is short for glomerular filtration rate, and this is another blood test to check how well the kidneys are working. GFR basically checks how much blood passes through the glomeruli each minute. So when your GFR is being tested, they're going to take a blood sample and send it to the lab. And this is where they're going to look at the creatinine levels in the blood sample that has been tested. Once they know what your creatinine level is, they're going to apply some very specific criteria to estimate the GFR. There are a bunch of different formulas out there that are used for children and adults and different races, but the criteria to estimate the GFR are going to include things like age, ethnicity, gender, height, weight, and then all compared to your blood creatinine levels. The GFR is going to be used to evaluate stages of renal disease, and anything above 60 milliliters per minute, which means that the glomeruli are filtering 60 milliliters of blood per minute, is going to be normal. Now, this is something that actually gets tested quite often before a patient has some sort of contrast used for imaging. So like a CT image or MRI, they're going to check the GFR. And if a person's GFR is too low, then that is a contraindication to use contrast for a CT the kidneys aren't going to be able to get that contrast out of the body quickly enough because the glomeruli are not filtering the blood quick enough. So if a person's GFR is too low, they typically cannot have contrast because then that contrast will be stuck in their body much longer than we want it to be in there. If the GFR is above 60, again, that's absolutely normal, and they can go ahead with the contrast exam. I did include a link to a GFR calculator if you want to kind of play with some of the numbers. So if we click on this, there's tons of them on the internet. Most hospitals are going to have the one that they want you to use linked somewhere. But this one goes to DaVita, which is a dialysis company. So on the DaVita calculator, we can actually see some kind of interesting things that kind of helps you to understand a little bit more about GFR. So let's go ahead and calculate this. And we get a GFR value of 2. I really made this uh, patient sick. So that puts them into a stage 5 kidney disease. So remember, 60 was normal. This uh, supposed patient has a GFR of 2. They are most likely not doing very well if we're in stage 5 kidney disease. So again, that calculator was just through a link in your workbook. You can always Google if you want to find a different calculator and just kind of play around with the numbers. See how your creatinine, age, ethnicity, gender can all affect your GFR or glomerular filtration rate. Now we saw in our patient that their GFR was at two milliliters. So I made that person very, very sick. And that put them into stage five kidney failure. So we are looking less than 15 milliliters per minute is stage five. That's less than 15% of their kidney function left. Here you'll see that even being down to 60 is considered stage two renal failure, but we still consider 60 and above to be normal. So stage one, stage two, completely normal. 3A and 3B, we're going to start to see a little bit of loss of kidney function. Stage 4 is typically when people are going to start looking at dialysis, and then stage 5 is in desperate need of 
um, not only dialysis, but a transplant. You do not need to memorize any of these GFRs or, or what aligns with what stage of kidney failure. I just wanted to point this out that this is a thing that doctors use to stage kidney failure and chronic kidney disease is a very, very common reason that we get ultrasounds ordered of the kidneys. I see indications all the time for stage three or stage four chronic kidney disease when renal ultrasounds are ordered. BUN is short for blood urea nitrogen, and this is another blood test, and this is going to provide very important information about the kidney's function. If you have kidney disease, the urea can build up in your body, and that can lead to some really serious health problems. That could be as serious as blood pressure, anemia, or even heart disease. Now, if you recall, urea was the byproduct of the liver breaking down amino acids in the hepatocytes. What we had left over was that acid, the hepatocytes neutralized it into urea, and then pushed that urea out into the blood. The idea then is that the urea is going to head to the kidneys eventually, and then get filtered out and released through our urine. So if we have a lot of urea in the blood, it means that the kidneys aren't working very efficiently, and it's causing that urea to kind of circulate the body more so than it should be. We just talked about those different stages of chronic kidney disease. It takes to get into stage 3B before you're at 50% of your kidney function. And what's really interesting about the kidneys is that they do not show symptoms. By testing the blood urea and nitrogen, we are capable of uncovering kidney problems at a much earlier stage when it is more correctable. So BUN is a very common blood test that is run on most patients during a physical or during any sort of acute illness. And an elevated BUN is not always going to indicate kidney disease immediately. It can be elevated by just being dehydrated, or it can be a sign of some sort of urinary tract obstruction, some sort of trauma to the body. Uh, medications can cause it to increase. Even a keto or a high-protein diet can cause it to increase as well. But the kidneys can be damaged and lose up to as much as 50% of their function before blood tests are ever going to recognize that something is abnormal. So these kidneys are incredibly resilient. And then we'll see as much of 80% loss, which lined up with stage four renal disease before a patient actually experiences any symptoms. So it takes a long time for those kidneys to tucker out and not be able to do their job well enough to the point that we can detect it through blood tests or by symptoms. In your workbook, then you'll see this review of the renal blood tests. We talked about BUN, creatinine, and GFR. The ones that we didn't talk about, we have talked about in previous chapters. LDH is lactic dehydrogenase acid, which is usually just referred to as lactic acid. And that's really found in just about every organ system. So when there is damage to an organ, it'll typically release the LDH, and then that can be seen in blood tests. So in relation to kidneys, if there is a renal infarction, which means there's death to a portion of the kidney, or if there's chronic kidney disease, which damages the kidney cells, then we'll see that LDH could possibly be released from the kidneys and elevated. An increase in white blood cells typically indicates some sort of infection or inflammation in the body. If we are concerned about kidneys, then we're looking at like a UTI. And hematocrit, when reduced, typically means that there is some sort of internal bleeding. Another test that can be performed to understand how the kidneys are functioning is to test your urine. And that is what a urinalysis test does. Typically, you will pee in a cup and through the urinalysis, they are able to check for urinary tract infections, uh, other kidney problems, and even diabetes. It's a very common and easy to perform test. We almost have to do it before any sort of treatment that we go through. Again, anytime that we go to a physical or are experiencing acute disease, they almost always want some sort of urine sample so they can test it. Some of the things that they're going to look at the urine for is its color. What does it look like? Is it clear? Or is it cloudy? Does it smell funny? Uh, they're also going to test the pH level of the urine, if it's too acidic or too basic. They're going to want to know if there are substances in there that shouldn't be in there, such as like blood or glucose, ketones, bilirubin. Then they're also going to take a look to see if there are any cells or crystals that shouldn't be in there. And then many times when a UTI or urinary tract infection is suspected, then they're going to let it try to grow out some bacteria or other germs. Typically what happens with a urinalysis, it's going to start with the dipstick test. And this is where a thin plastic stick with chemicals on it is going to be dipped into the urine. And then when they pull that stick out, those chemicals are going to turn certain colors. And depending on the colors, it's going to recognize if substances are present 
or if their levels are above normal. So you can see in the picture here, we've got this dip dipstick here placed into the urine, and then you've got usually an indicator that you can look through to understand what that urine is showing us. So for example, this uh, row here, they're testing matches up with this color here. Is that normal or not? Depends on what this is. And so they can kind of look at the colors exhibited by the chemical dipstick, compare it to the chart, and then they will know if there's an excessive amount of like sugars or protein, something like that, and to what degree they're being expressed in. So some of the items that the dipstick are going to test for, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but again, we can test for acidity. We want to know, is it concentrated? Is there too much water in there? If you are very dehydrated, then you're not able to release enough of that water. And so your urine becomes very concentrated. If you're drinking a ton of fluids, then your urine is going to be very weak. Uh, we can also test to see if there's protein, sugars, ketones, bilirubin, or blood in the urine through the dipstick test. And they can also tell if there's any sort of infection in there as well uh, by testing the nitrates or leukocytes. After the dipstick test, then what ends up happening is that a lab technician is going to take a look at the urine under a microscope. By looking at urine under the microscope, then they can count the white blood cells that are in it, if any red blood cells, if any bacteria or yeast. They might also be able to see some casts or crystals, which are a result of either kidney disorders or kidney stones. So by physically looking at the urine, they can actually get even more information about what is causing a patient's symptoms. And again, we've got the summary of the urinalysis findings in your workbook. The biggest thing that I would focus on for the urinalysis findings is to understand how the medical terminology goes together. Bilirubinuria is bilirubin in the urine. That has to do with the liver. Hematuria is blood in the urine. And we can have gross, which means you can physically see it in the urine. Or you can have microscopic, which it was only recognized under the microscope. Bacteria is bacteria in the urine, typically goes with UTIs. Pyuria is pus in the urine, again, UTIs. So you should know what the different prefixes are and how they are associated with the urine. Section 8.8, .8, ultrasound appearance. So we're finally ready to take a look at the kidneys and bladder under ultrasound. Remember that the ultrasound looks for structural changes. So we really need to understand what a normal kidney looks like so we are better able at recognizing an abnormal kidney. First, evaluating the renal parenchyma. So remember, we have the renal capsule. That's the fibrous capsule around the outside of the kidney, known as the true capsule. That's going to appear as a hyperechoic, very thin, highly reflective line that goes all the way around the periphery of the kidney. The renal cortex then is the next layer in. The renal cortex usually takes on kind of a mid to medium gray, and it should have a very homogenous appearance to it. When we compare it to the normal liver or spleen, we typically see that the renal cortex is more hypoechoic to maybe isoechoic to the liver or spleen parenchyma. Next layer in then is the renal medulla. These are going to show up as triangular, round, or kind of blunted appearing structures. If there's urine within them, they're going to appear a little bit more anechoic. If there is not urine in them, they are going to possibly be not visible or slightly even more hypochoic than the renal cortex. And it's very common for new scanners to mistake the anechoic pyramids as cysts. So really take a look around when you see what you suspect might be a cyst. Are there other structures within the middle of the kidney that have the same appearance? Most likely if you can identify a few of them, especially if they have those bands of cortex in between the columns of Burton, then those are most likely anechoic renal pyramids versus true cysts. The renal sinus then is at the center of the kidney, and this is going to be very bright, very echo dense, and it kind of takes on an oval appearance with some irregular borders, kind of representing the areas around the collecting system. The renal sinus appears very bright because of the fat found within the tissue. The hilum is also visible by ultrasound as you sweep more medially on the kidney you're going to see the cortex kind of break away. And this is where the hilum is. At the hilum then, if you use color, you should be able to see the renal artery and vein exiting and entering. And if the ureter is dilated, you'd also be able to see an anechoic tubular structure at the hilum. So here's a very normal appearing kidney. 
We got the drawing underneath here in the actual picture. This is a kidney in the longitudinal plane. We can see the true capsule or the renal capsule. It is this hyperechoic line that's going to go around all of the kidney. You're not necessarily going to see it around all the kidney because that's going to depend more on physics, but you should see it in a good portion of it. So we can see it really well on this superior pole here. The next thing that we can see then is the renal cortex. Remember, that's going to take on that mid to low level gray. It should be darker than a normal spleen and a normal liver. The next spot in then are the renal pyramids. Now, these ones are relatively dark compared to the cortex, so they most likely have some urine within them. You're not always going to see the renal pyramids. You might only see a few of them, and they might almost appear anechoic cystic-like. So they can take on a variety of appearances. It just kind of depends on the state that their kidney is in. The biggest thing to look for, though, is if there's cortex expanding in between each of the pyramids. That would be more of a confirmation of medullary pyramids versus some other pathology. And then in the central portion of the kidney is the sinus. The sinus is the brightest portion of the kidney. Usually kind of takes on that irregular ovoid pattern in the center of the kidney. In this example, we have switched to a transverse view of the kidney. So again, we can see the renal cortex. We can see the renal capsule as well. And this time we have color on, and the color helps us to recognize that there are vessels coming in and out of the hilum. So here is the hilum where the vessels cross over. There is a physical break within the cortex and then you will see those vessels travel into the sinus. You can see a little bit of a pyramid right here. And so if they are visible, then we can still see them in the transverse plane. I had mentioned earlier that if you put color on the hilum and there is a dilated ureter, you might be able to see a tubular structure without any blood flow in it. However, ureters are not typically visible unless they are dilated. So if there is fluid in the ureter due to a blockage or maybe due to an extra renal pelvis, that is when we are going to be able to see them. Otherwise, we don't typically evaluate them with ultrasound. Moving to the bladder then, we're going to move down to the pelvis. When we look at the bladder in transverse, we can see the anterior abdominal wall down through the posterior part. We should, in transverse, see kind of a square appearance to the bladder. You should be able to visualize the bladder wall all the way around. And as a stenographer, you really want to make sure that you're looking at the wall all the way around, looking for any defects, looking for anything hanging off of it. The urine inside the bladder should be anechoic in healthy patients. Sometimes we start to see debris floating through here if they have some sort of urinary tract infection. And then we can use color to recognize where the urinal jets are. So we have the right urinal jet and the left urinal jet. And these are coming from the trigon area of the bladder. And by using color, we can see the motion of the urine coming in. When indicated, you want to make sure that you are measuring the bladder in three dimensions. This one happened to measure it in four dimensions, but this is the transverse view of the bladder. Measuring across where this blue B line is, that would be the width of our bladder. And then when we also measure in a longitudinal and an AP dimension, we can take those three measurements to figure out how much urine is in the bladder. And this is going to be helpful for the post void residual exam. When we do post void residual exams, your patient is going to come to the exam with a very, very full bladder. You are then going to measure the volume, have them go to the bathroom, empty out as much as they can. And when they come back, you repeat the measurements in the three dimensions. And then you compare what their pre-void and post-void volumes are. Looking at some of the vasculature associated with the kidneys, one of the first ones and kind of one of the fun ones, and now that you know that it's here, you're definitely going to see it. And it's an awesome test question. What is this vessel? Well, this is the right renal artery. Remember that the right renal artery courses posterior to the IVC. So here we have the IVC. This is a hepatic vein here. This is liver. And we are centered in the longitudinal plane over the IVC, so we can't see right to left in this image. But if we could go to the patient's left, we would see the aorta. We know that the aorta is going to give rise to the right renal artery. 
and for the way that it courses in the body towards the patient's right, we get a cross section of it. Now, if we were to put color on it, you'll see a little red dot pop in underneath the IVC. More often than not, you are going to see the right renal artery posterior to the IVC. However, there is some congenital changes that can make it anterior. But perfect test question, what is this vessel posterior to the IVC? You should know that it's the right renal artery. The left renal vein then also has an interesting course. It is going to travel in between the SMA and the aorta. And this is the path it takes, again, because of how the organs are related to the vessels that they're heading back to. So here we're in a long aorta view, not able to see left and right in this picture, but if we were to move to the patient's right, we would run into the IVC. So what we are seeing here is the left renal vein in transverse coursing towards the IVC. This is the SMA above it and the aorta below it. In this picture on the bottom here, we are now in a transverse view, and this shows us very nicely. We have the aorta here, and we have the SMA here. So SMA, aorta, and what we have coursing in between them is the left renal vein. And that left renal vein then is going to join up with the IVC. And this happens to be the portal vein up here. So again, the left renal vein leaving the left kidney over here, traveling across the body, in between the SMA and the aorta to get to the IVC. When we look at the renal arteries and veins at the kidney itself, we can see in this first image here, we can see the aorta in the far field, giving rise to the most likely left renal artery. Notice that the left renal vein is anterior to the artery, because that's the way that it goes. And then we can see it branching into segmental and then we have our interlobar because they're in between the pyramids. After that point, everything kind of gets a little jumbled together, but we would have the arcuates and then the cortical radiate. And we can actually appreciate that a little bit more on this side with that color. So when you do a perfusion color on your kidneys, you want to make sure that you decrease your color scale, decrease your PRF, so you can be very sensitive to the slow flow in those vessels that are way out in the cortex. So decrease your PRF, decrease your color scale, increase your color gain, and you will probably be able to get a very nice, very pretty branching pattern of your vessels. As far as measurements go, ultrasound is actually pretty good at measuring the kidneys as long as you're doing it right. So the adult kidney in the literature quite often says anywhere from nine to 12 centimeters is normal. I do want to put out there that ever since I've been scanning, a 9 centimeter adult kidney is on the small side. Most of the kidneys that I get, as long as you make them kind of pointy on both ends, you'll see that the length of the kidney on most people is somewhere around like the 11, 12, 13 centimeter range. Not uncommon to see them up to 14 centimeters in just your normal adult. If the patient is very tall, very skinny, it's more likely that they are going to also have tall, skinny organs. So if you have a very tall patient and they're pushing 14 centimeters, that's probably just normal for their body habitus. As far as diameter goes on, that's going to be the width of the kidney. Anywhere from four to six centimeters is very average. And then we'll see an anterior posterior measurement between two and a half and four centimeters. And again, that kind of relates back to, are they tall and skinny? They probably have skinny organs as well. In the neonate, we expect that the kidneys are going to be much smaller. When we get into some pediatric pathology, we will cover a little bit more about the pediatric measurements. So for this part, I would focus mostly on the adult kidney measurements. The ureters again connect the kidneys to the bladder. They range anywhere from 28 to 34 centimeters. The bladder wall can be between 3 and 6 millimeters, and we typically look at that when the bladder is full. So when the bladder is full, we expect less than three. When the bladder is empty, we expect less than six. Anything thicker than that might indicate some sort of infection in the urinary tract system. And as far as the urethras go, we did comment on that earlier. Four centimeters for the female, 20 centimeters for the male. But the ureters and the urethra are typically not measured by ultrasound. They just kind of round out our normal measurement chart. When you are measuring the kidneys, you want to make sure that you are getting symmetrical measurements on both sides. 
So you should not have more than a one centimeter difference in length in your pediatric kidneys, and you do not want more than a two centimeter difference in length in your adult kidneys. I see quite often new scanners kind of just take whatever they can get. They think that they've got those edges nice and pointy, and they're getting nine centimeters maybe on the right. They roll their patients to get to the left side, and they end up with a 12 centimeter kidney. That difference of three centimeters could be indicating some sort of disease happening on that right side. So if you get measurements that are very, very different, you need to go back and try to remeasure things. See if you can elongate, roll them, breathe them, do whatever you can to make sure that you're getting the true measurement of the kidneys because that difference can indicate some sort of disease. And it's even more important in our pediatric cases, we expect that the kidneys are going to grow at about the same rate. If one of them stops growing, then we are concerned that there might be something going on. So to reiterate, the kidneys should be within one centimeter of each other in pediatrics and no more than two centimeters in adults. The next few slides are going to cover the variants that we learned about. We saw kind of diagrams drawn out of them, but let's take a look at their ultrasound appearance. So here we have a prominent column of Burton. We have a pyramid here, pyramid over here. We have the cortex surrounding, and what we're seeing is a large kind of lump that comes into the sinus in between the pyramids of the kidney. We know that this is a column of Burton because it is the same echogenicity as the cortex. It's also very homogenous and it looks like renal parenchyma. Renal cancers tend to look much scarier than this. They're going to have more homogeneity to them. They're going to have increased vascularity, possibly some cysts in there, calcifications. They're going to take on a very different appearance. So the column of Burton will catch your eye when you are scanning. Just make sure that it looks like the renal cortex and you can document it and leave it for the radiologist to read at that point. Same idea with the dromedary hump, uh, except now we're seeing that bulge go out of the lateral side of the kidney. So again, we have cortex all the way around, sinus in the middle here, but we're seeing a bulge. Again, this usually occurs on the left kidney because of the way that the spleen sits right here, kind of pushing that part of the kidney up. If you're concerned that this is a cancer or some sort of mass hanging off of the kidney, Again, try to see if you can connect it through with the cortex. Cancers are going to take on a different look, but you can always document, take pictures in both planes, use color, and let the radiologist determine the finding. Here we have an example of a junctional parenchymal defect. Remember that is where the kidney failed to fuse all the way together. And then because of that little gap right there, the perirenal fat is going to fill it in. So it ends up looking like a bright little triangle or a little notch taken out of the cortex. So we have the renal cortex all the way around, sinus in the middle here, you can actually see the renal capsule, and it's just getting filled in with some extra fat. Usually again, those are on the superior anterior border of the kidney. This is a junctional parenchymal defect visualized in the transverse view. So again, we can see the cortex of the kidney. This is the hilum here, this is the sinus, we just look like we have this little notch, little bite taken out of the cortex that is now filled in with fat. Sinus lipomatosis is the expansion of the sinus into the cortex, and then it has extra fatty deposits within it. So it looks extra bright and kind of looks like it's engulfing the whole inside of the kidney. We'll see that the cortex appears a little bit thinner. The pyramids might not be as obvious, but we can still see them here. And it'll just look like a very, very prominent sinus. Again, sinus lipomatosis does not have any bearing on how the kidney is going to function. However, you do not want to confuse this with other diseases that can cause the kidney to become hyperechoic and can cause the cortex to thin, which does affect the renal function. Next up, we have an image of fetal lobulations. The fetal lobulations, remember, are very normal in children up to five, and it's because those kidneys haven't been bouncing around enough to kind of smooth out. So in children, in neonates, and in quite a few adults, what we end up seeing then is kind of a lumpy, bumpy kidney. And it's very obvious in the long view, you will see just extra lumps kind of around the outside of the kidney. Again, very normal, will not affect the function of the kidney, but you can always document anything that you see that is not normal. Here's an example of an extra renal pelvis. 
The calipers are around the extra renal portion of it. We actually have the kidney back here. And so we just have a stretched out pelvis that's outside of the kidney and it's just holding on to urine. Quite often, if you roll these patients into a prone position, you can get the extra renal pelvis to disappear. And the last one was renal agenesis. Now, renal agenesis was kind of that one that really is a congenital anomaly, and it can affect how the patient functions, especially if it's bilateral, because that's not compatible with life. But in the event of renal agenesis, what we are going to see is an empty renal fossa. So there will be no kidney hanging out with the liver, no kidney hanging out with the spleen. And if you see that, you want to make sure that that kidney isn't somewhere else, like in the pelvis. If it truly is renal agenesis, what you'll typically see then is the other kidney is huge. And that's because of that compensatory hypertrophy. So the kidney gets very large, making up for the work of two kidneys. Our last section then is section 8.9 protocol. So indications for renal ultrasound are going to include very specific things to the kidneys. The kidneys are quite often included in an abdominal complete or in the right upper quadrant. We also take a look at the right kidney. And typically, the kidneys are not of concern when those types of exams are ordered, but we include them in those studies to complete a very thorough examination of the organs. Now, when a renal ultrasound is ordered, it's usually because they suspect something is wrong with the kidneys themselves. They don't care about the liver. They want to look at the kidneys. Some indications for looking at the kidneys then would be to check on renal size. They may have had a CT that showed a difference between renal size. This will give a three-dimensional measurement of the kidneys. It's also really common that that patient will have a CT, and on that CT report, the radiologist will dictate something along the lines of renal lesion seen, use ultrasound to further characterize. And the whole point of that is, are they cysts or are they solid masses, or maybe they're hemorrhagic cysts? CT isn't super good at that. So they come to ultrasound, and we take a look through, match up what the CT, you know, if it says it's a superior pole possible cyst, then we're really going to check out that superior pole, get really good pictures to further characterize things seen by other imaging modalities. So not uncommon to follow up other imaging modalities to look for renal masses or cysts. If a patient has symptoms of urinary obstruction, so that'd be like stones stuck somewhere in the urinary tract, we can look for fluid backing up. We can look for the stones themselves. We can also evaluate for Sequelae to UTI, so like a renal abscess, if the patient recently had surgery or a biopsy, we might want to look for a renal hematoma. Especially in the pediatric population, the ureters become very enlarged. It's called mega ureter, and we can look for them and kind of evaluate how everything is connected together, how much of the urine is flowing back into the kidneys, is there something blocking it on the bladder side of things? If there's suspicion of ureter pathology, then ultrasound is actually pretty good at seeing those ureters again when they're dilated. We also can use it to take a look through the bladder, looking for any sort of masses, bladder cancer, uh, bladder diverticular, little pouches off the bladder. So we're very good at looking at fluid filled structures. And then we can also use ultrasound to evaluate blood flow. And we quite often use that for renal transplants and to evaluate for some sort of renal artery stenosis. Uh, lastly, then we can also provide guidance for biopsies or aspirations. As far as the transducer that we use, we typically use the curved linear or vector transducer on the lower end for frequencies. On children, it's actually really helpful to use a linear transducer or a microconvex transducer. Just has a different footprint that allows us to see the parenchyma of the kidney very, very well. So typically for children and infants, we're going to use a little bit higher frequency, a little bit different footprint than our large adult curved linear transducer. As far as patient prep goes, there is not a lot of prep as far as not eating. The bowel can get in the way, but we are pretty capable of visualizing the kidney either from an anterior, coronal, or posterior approach. So we can typically get pictures of the kidney despite their PO status. Now, if the patient is expected to have a post-void residual, we do need them to come with a full bladder. 
And in fact, just being hydrated in general typically helps visualization of the bladder and the kidneys themselves. When a patient is scheduled for a Doppler, then we typically do request that those patients are NPO, so we are able to connect the renal artery and vein all the way from the hilum to the IVC and to the aorta. As far as patient position goes, we typically start with the patient in supine and check all of our windows, the anterior, intercostal, and semi-posterior approach. If we are unable to see the kidneys well, then we are going to try rolling the patient either into RLD or LLD positions. Once the patient is rolled, that gives us more access to the posterior approach. Quite often though, the coronal image is going to be our best opportunity for visualizing the kidney. And sometimes we can actually roll our patients into prone. Uh, did that quite often with infants. We would scan right next to their spine with a linear transducer and you were able to see the kidneys beautifully. When you come from a prone approach or posterior approach, it does change how the kidneys look compared to the anterior approach. So you want to make sure that you are labeling anytime you change the patient position into RLD, LLD, or prone. For a complete renal protocol, both kidneys and the bladder should be evaluated. We're going to take slices of the kidney in both the longitudinal plane and the transverse plane. When I'm imaging my kidneys, I usually like to start with long, and I like to find the longest portion of the kidney so I can get that measurement right away and understand where middle is. From there, I usually sweep out to lateral, which is going towards the patient's side, and then sweep back into medial to evaluate the hilum and how the blood vessels are coming in. So it's three pictures in long, and then you turn into transverse. In transverse, I typically just start at the top of the kidney and work my way down, moving from superior to mid, where another measurement is taken, and going all the way through inferior. You're going to do that for both kidneys. And then to complete the renal complete examination, we are going to take a look at the bladder. Typically, you're going to need a long and transverse bladder view with the right and left urinal jets visualized. If the provider has ordered PVRs, then we are going to take a pre-void measurement and a post-void measurement. Quite often, the machine is going to have a calc package. That means you are telling the machine what you are measuring, and the machine will take your measurements and perform calculations. In the case of the pre- and post-void, it'll calculate the volumes that were found within the bladder, but you can also do that on your own using a calculator and the correct formula. The formula has some different iterations on the internet. However, for the most part, it is a long measurement multiplied by the transverse measurement, multiplied by the anterior posterior measurement, and then multiplied by 0.5 or 0.52. And that is the end of our urinary tract, anatomy, physiology, and ultrasound appearance lecture. Remember to work through the activities in your workbook, go through your label workbook, and check out those nerd check questions, see if you recognize and can recall the information presented.